just ask that your word would reveal to us those, those undeniable truths that make our faith real, that make you real, Lord. We lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's see. Any announcements? Uh, you turn Friday. Woo! Say what? That's right. All right. And um, please turn your phones off or silence them. And let's get into this. We have like, man, I'm going to be cranking. So I'm going to do at least a half a chapter tonight. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm going to try to do three. So, yeah. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to shoot you guys right now. Here we go. Uh, let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now, Lord. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for this moment. I'm um, going to lift up this study to you that it not be... Uh, something that is taken in vain by any of us, that we realize and understand that the early Christians, the early believers uh, that we see in the book of Acts as we're going through on Sundays, that this is what they were taught. Um, they weren't taught uh, Matthew, John, you know, they were taught the Gospels, they were taught to about Jesus Christ, but they were also taught this. They were taught Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through. This, this that we're reading was their Bible. And as we come to this right now, we just pray that you would open it up to us as you did to them and help us to increase as we read it and to grow as we read it. And we just thank you so much for this time together in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So one of the things is, is I was beginning to go into this study and begin to do it is um, I was reminded and we're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 20. We looked at the moral and ceremonial laws last time. Um, and this is the penalties for breaking the law that we're going to start here in chapter 20. Um, but as I was going through this and doing it, you know, I, I, shortcuts to me are amazing. And, 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 and you'll get what I'm connecting with here um, as I do this because I love using computers. Marco knows it. He, you know, he's, it, and he's always talking to me about it, about get me getting him to show him stuff. Um, but I, I love using computers. I especially love my Mac. Um, and when I get these shortcuts going and I learn how to use these applications, it becomes this awesome thing to me because it's like, you know, I feel like I've discovered something completely new, like I just discovered because of the particular Bible app that I have on my computer. When I'm working on my Bible studies, I can put in like a reference. I can just type it in like Leviticus 21 through 5. And then I can highlight it, hit a button, and boom, it types and it pulls in the entire verse for me there on my page so I don't have to go over, copy, paste, do all these other things, right? It, it's just yet something else that, that gets me going to where I'm trying to get quicker with a click. And I always tell Liz, like, things like this will shave years off of your life. And she's like, I'm just going to do it my way. Stop telling me what to do, right? So... But one of the things that I like about this is not the shortcut. That's not what I want you to get. What I want you to understand is the more and more you really learn about the Bible, the more you let it impact your life, the more different you will be and the better you will be for it. It's the idea that Paul talks about in the scriptures of the difference between drinking milk, and if you're always crying like a baby, then you're on milk. Okay, But a man, he eats meat. And when things happen to him in his life, he reacts to it like a man. And the Bible tells us that we need to go on from just drinking milk and the simple things of the word and go into these things that are deep. And that's what we're in here in Leviticus. And the more we learn about the Bible, the more we learn about ourselves and the more you and I can change. Leviticus chapter 20. Coming into this, again, as another preface, you know, my second preface for the thing it's like never going to get through this, right? But I, I just want you to think, you've got to understand, these guys have been in Egypt for hundreds of years. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. They've been set free, and then here's the law, right? It's like, oh, man, whoa, that's rough. Oh, wow. And then here we go again, Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through. Let's, um, well, let's see how far we can get. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. So remember, God, you know, Molech is the god of the Canaanites, and he was a god of you know, many others. He was known by different names. And oftentimes it would be a metal statue that would be heated greatly with fire. And then they would 
um, hit drums really loudly and they would sacrifice their children upon it. And the drums were done really loud to cover the screams of the infants as it was going on. So this was a horrid, horrid practice. And he says, you know, any who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. It doesn't matter how your baby's born, what it is, you don't do this. He goes on, he says, the people of the land shall stone him with stones. And look what he says in verse 3. I, so this is God himself, says, I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. So he's saying these are people who say they're believers, but yet they're going and they're sacrificing to this God. And then you're going to come in my temple? Huh. Your sacrifice is useless. That is exactly what he is saying here. You're going to act like you believe in me and you're going to worship him? It's the same thing with many Christians today. They go and they say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I love him, I love him, I love him. Boom. You know, the moment they hit the doors, they look just like the devil again. You know, it's that idea that you and I got to get. He gave his life for us. And things need to be different. And notice he says he will cut his face off. This is him saying this. He says he'll separate him. That's not even the killing part, right? And it says, and if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, then he gives some of his descendants to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off from his people, all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. For you and I to worship other gods, for you and God to do any of these things is equated to prostitution. It's giving yourself away. And the reason that they're sacrificing to Molech is for better, you know, for better crops, better fields, to fit in with everybody else. And this is something that you and I have to be very, very careful of. And you've got to understand, again, when people come to Christ, they need to understand our God is a moral God. He is a just God. He is a righteous, holy God. Verse 6, and the person who turns the mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Now, some commentators say that cut him off is killing. But I don't see that here. And, you know, the reason being, and, you know, and and there are some commentators say that it is simply banishment. And you've got to understand here, if you prostitute themselves with mediums of familiar spirits, he will set his face against that person, cut him off from his people. This is shunning. But it's not just being shunned by the people, it's being shunned by the Lord. So if you're checking your, you know, your horoscope every day, guess what you're consulting? It's not God. And don't give me that thing about the scripture said, well, he would put his signs in the heavens and the stars. Which are, that's not the same thing. One is mysticism. It's astrology. It's wrong. The other is God using it to point out the fulfillment of his prophecies and the things that he was going to do. It's two different things. And no, you know, and, and, you know, guys, I understand before I became a believer, I thought for sure. And I've actually argued with other believers. I thought for sure that, you know, I saw my uncle in my room after he had been dead for so many years, et cetera, et cetera. But I want you to understand it wasn't. No matter how great the feeling was, no matter, no matter how good it was, you know, I had a fever one night when I was a kid and thought Abraham Lincoln came into my room. I was that gone, right? I was that sick. And the thing is, you know, uh, uh, so many people tried to convince me it was his ghost. But it's not. It's not. He says if you even turn to people who deal with mediums and familiar spirits, mediums are those that communicate with the dead, you know, If you're going to hook up with the Ghostbusters, then you have turned away from him, he says. And he says, I will shun that person. God himself says it. And then he goes on in verse 7. He says, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. When he gives his life for us, he makes us clean. He did not die for us to go roll back in it. Okay? I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I set you apart for me. 
For everyone, verse 9, who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. The idea with this is you hear it, you know it, you know better. For you to go do this is to take it upon yourself. Your blood is on yourself. He's saying you know the difference between right and wrong. And the cursing that he's talking here is not just some kid yelling back at his mom and dad. The cursing idea, you know, to curse in the Bible was to condemn to hell, was to take somebody into something bad. Right? So this is the kid saying, I want you dead because I want my stuff, I want this, I want that. Okay, um, we had talked about how it's kind of similar to the Patria Potestas of the Romans. The Patria Potestas in the, you know, for Romans, that was the right of the father. He basically could kill his kids if he wanted to. Um, you know, if his baby was born after a while, if it got difficult to take care of him, they could literally throw him in the river. It didn't matter. Okay. But with the Jews, it changed. And many other cultures were like that, too. Okay, especially at the time when this was written. This was so different. This was, this was crazy at the time. Because this, and we're going to see later on in Deuteronomy, he's going to say, you can't just kill your kids. You've got to take them before the elders. The elders got to hear all the evidence. And if the elders say, yeah, this kid is cursing his parents, this kid is rebelling and refuses to see the light, then they would stone him to death. You know, so believe it or not, the kid actually had this. Um, so this was not just disrespecting, but it was literally threatening. Okay, uh, verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall, shall surely be put to death. Um, the person that caught them had to, you know, the persons that caught them, mouth of two or three witnesses, right, according to the scriptures, Deuteronomy again, the persons that caught them had to bring, you know, he, like if I caught them, then I would have to go get another witness, another man, to bring them and say, see what's going on here. And then we would have to take them before the council and say they have committed adultery. you know. And then the elders would say, pick up the stones. And then we would pick up the stones and we would have to be the first ones chunking them. Which tells you why rarely was this enforced in Israel. In the uh, Midrash and um, some of the Talmuds, they said that for centuries, many, you know, nobody was ever punished like this for adultery. And sometimes when they did it, they would get even more creative in the way that they would do it because they got that they so rarely got to do it that it was almost like, you know, like they used to celebrate hangings back in the old west, right? It's like, you know, popcorn, popcorn before the guy hangs, right? That kind of thing, you know? So but they had to be the first in line to do it, which is why it didn't happen a lot. But it's also one of the reasons that you see Jesus, okay? When you see Jesus with the woman that was brought forward for adultery, they're not going according to the law. So when they come up and they say, hey, you know, she's called an adultery. Should we stone her? What are we going to do, Jesus? And then he writes in the ground, and then he says, you know, he is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. What that means is, is you're the accuser. You're the accuser. And it says him and her. So where is he at? You know, for you to do this correctly, if you if they were to just stone the woman, they would be in sin. And they know it. So everybody drops their stones and goes away. All right. Uh, verse 11. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be surely put to death. And remember, we talked about that uncovering of nakedness is a, you know, is a uh, is an idiom for sex. Okay. Both of them shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there may be no wickedness among you. If a man mates with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. We've talked about most of these in the past. We're not going to go over them in detail. But everything is plain and clear there. And it's not just talking about worship. It is relating to the culture as it was during the day and how accepted that it was. There were many you know, um, uh, sex things that were involved in the, in the worship of Molech and other gods that were in Canaan and Egypt and stuff like that. So he is causing a separation here, but this is not just about worship. 
Because you see, he doesn't say who does this in worship or who does this. And the words that he uses in the scriptures here has nothing to do with worship. It's the simple act of it. Okay? Um, And it's death. It's death. If a man, verse 14, marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there may be no wickedness among you. Now, when we see burned with fire, it's not burned alive. Okay? When they say burn with fire here, this is a Hebrew idiom, and it means to burn like trash. So basically what it means is if you perform this particular act, you're going to be stoned to death, and then we're going to burn you like garbage. You won't be buried. You won't be honored. There will be nothing there. And you know you know this ahead of time, he says, in all these things, your blood is on you if you do this. So whenever you see that burn with fire, now some people, there are some commentators, I think it was Campbell that said, burned with fire in some places, the words that are used there could mean branded. It could mean when they did this thing, you know, they would be burned or branded so that there would be a physical mark on the outside showing them as hedonists. Okay, kind of like that old story of the scarlet letter, right? Um, they shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there may be no wickedness among you. And this thing, uh, again, reminds us of even us in the scriptures in Corinthians where Paul talks about if someone is sinning in the church, we need to put them outside the church. Okay, it's not a shunning as much as it is to remind them that they're supposed to be living a particular way in among us. You know, and it's repent of that sin and come on back in. We don't shun people. We don't push people outside, you know, just to teach them a lesson and to whoop them. It's so that they turn back to him because we want them to come back into fellowship. We want them to understand that they are loved. But, you know, he says that you cannot keep sin in the camp or in the church. If a man mates with an animal, verse 15, he shall surely be put to death and you shall kill the animal. So he's going over it again so that you will be clear that this is happening, right? If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall be surely put to death. Their blood is upon them. Now, just a really quick break. Um, Fifteen offenses in Israel were capital crimes. The striking or cursing of parents. So if you hit your parent, you were definitely done, right? That was the same thing as attempted murder in their eyes, okay? Um, Breaking the Sabbath. That was, you know, that was a capital offense. Blaspheming God. Engaging in occult practices. Not someone that follows a medium, right? That was cut off for this. But if you were a medium that communicates with the dead, you're going to die, okay? All right? Um, so if you just watch ghost hunters, you just get cut off. But if you are a ghost hunter, you're gone, okay? Um, and then he says uh, prophesying falsely, big one, adultery, rape, unchastity before marriage, incest, homosexuality, bestiality, kidnapping, idolatry, false witness in a case involving a capital crime, which is one of the ones that we've mentioned. If you lied about someone, you suffered the same fate they would have. Okay? Killing a human intentionally. Murder. Not war, but murder. All right? So those are the 15 offenses that were capital crimes. And I got references for those. If you guys need them, I can send them to you. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 17 through 21. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, sees her nakedness, and and she sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. Again, it's a loss of covenant relationship. It's the idea, if you do this, you are completely cut off from your people. You know, there is no, there is no, you know, there is no grace in this for them. Okay, understand that. They made the choice he has uncovered his sister's nakedness he shall bear his guilt verse 18 if a man lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness he has exposed her flow and she has uncovered the floor of her blood both of them shall be cut off from their people now some of these exiling some of these things and uncleanness we've seen before that there were sacrifices that could be done for them but in this case what he's talking about here is a little bit different And, you know, you just read the details of it, and we're not going to go into great big details on these. Like, this is an overview. I keep having to remind myself we want to just 
we're just going through this, right? You shall not eat anything you find a real interest in. You know, we can always get you some resources to get the details. Verse 19, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or of your father's sister, for that would uncover his near of kin. They shall bear the guilt. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If you know, so they understand the idea of you know close relations. Having children tends to lead to very bad things on a genetic level, right? Um, if a man takes his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. Thou shall be childless. Now, with that one, that's different when it comes to the Levites, okay? Because they were to be Levites. Levites were supposed to marry Levites. That tribe was supposed to, there was intermarriage that was looked at there, but they wanted them to be separate and as far apart as they could. Um, And, you know, again, we look at these things, and most of this stuff we see on TV every day, right? If you watch public television, if you watch national television channels, you see this thing on movies, and TV, and these things are enacted by and done by people as entertainment. And here, there are violent results for these acts being done. So you and I have to understand, this is, these are serious matters. Um, verse 22, Exodus 20, 22, you shall keep, you shall therefore, he goes and he says, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And the more and more we see so many nations that are being caught up in this, the more and more we see them begin to degrade morally on an ever-increasing scale, including the United States. You, You know, we have cities that are competing to be called Sin City in our country. Vegas right now holds the title. But other cities are competing for it. Places in Louisiana, Tennessee, here in Texas, New Mexico, and it goes on. And he says the nation, the land will literally vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. Okay? He he abhors the acts and the things that are being done in these nations, and he has tried to bring them around. He has spent hundreds of years trying to bring them to a point of repentance, and they have rejected him. But I have said to you, verse 24, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean and unclean animals, Uh, or between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make yourselves, you know, abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the people that you should be mine. So here it had to be a physical act, and we see in the book of Acts, when he drops down that canopy with the animals in it for Peter, that it has now become a spiritual ideal. For you and I to become believers, we become separate from the world, in it but not of it. Okay? And then he goes on. All right, so he says he sings, and he says, You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Peter reiterates that for us. If you go through the book of First Peter, you see where he says the same thing. A man or a woman, verse 27, who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. For you to take part in these practices, you know, and again, If you go by the Gospels, when Jesus is talking to people and he's talking about those and he gives the story of Lazarus, most of those know that parable, right? We look at it as a parable, but he talks about it matter-of-factly and many of the words that he uses in it points to it being him giving an account of how things are. And one of the things that Abraham says, okay, when the rich man says to Abraham and he says, hey, can you send him back to go tell my brothers? Because they don't know what hell is like. And Abraham says, no, there's a great gulf in between. Nobody goes back. Only one did, and that was Jesus. 
So if somebody tells you that ghosts are real, you know, you can tell them, well, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I know that's not true. All right? You're dealing with demonic spirits or people that are just liars. Okay? Because he says, if they do this, stone them to death. Their blood shall be upon them. We're not going to do that here. Somebody comes in and they, you know, and they think that they're a ghostbuster. We're just going to talk to them, minister to them. You know, and honestly, um, you know, especially if there's anybody watching online or going to see this later, you know, I, I just have to encourage you that if, because I know brothers in Christ who literally go to supernatural events to be the pastor that talks about, you know, what ghosts are. Um, I've heard somebody talk about um, how Wesley got into ghosts. And I'm talking about Wesley, the preacher of old who began the Methodist church. Okay. He used to think his house was haunted. Okay. And, and I just tried to tell the person, well, just because Wesley thought so, Wesley ain't the Bible, bro. I don't care if you're a Methodist. You know, he's not scripture. And, you know, and he tried to use things in the scripture where people that were very kind of, you know, when people thought, oh, I thought it was a ghost. That's because of old wives tales and because of, you know, just a supernatural kind of thing. Right. It's not real. OK, um, but when you see this and you understand what he's talking about with familiar spirits and the people that practice magic and do these supernatural things, you understand in Acts 19, 19, when people were getting saved and they were taking their magic books that were worth thousands and thousands of dollars and they were burning them. And it was because of verses like this, of chapters like this in the Bible, they would be taught that these things were wicked. And so they would take those things that were associated with that wickedness and throw it in the fire and burn it. Because they didn't want to sell it. It's like, you know, some of us, we're like, oh, man, these albums are really expensive. But I know they make me feel bad, but I'm going to put them on eBay, right? You know, and it's like, really? These guys were taking the things that they knew brought them into sin and brought them into a supernatural element. And they said, and they didn't say, oh, I'm going to sell them. I know somebody that's willing to give me $20,000 for this. They didn't do that. They took it and they put it in the fire because it was worth more to be obedient than it was to make some money. So the celebration of medium spirits, dark things, the celebration of immorality is bad, guys. It's bad. Chapter 21. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say, cause so now we're turning from just the people specifically to the priesthood. All right, to the priests, the sons of Aaron. So this is not just people that go into the temple, but also people that serve the temple proper. Some of them are going to be sweepers. Some of them are going to take the parts and bring them in, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, Say to them, none shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his daughter, um, and his brother, also his virgin sister who is near to him, who has, has no husband for her he may defile himself. Otherwise, he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Um, many of the requirements of the priests have been addressed earlier, and more will be done later on. And we know in Numbers 19, 11 through 14, anyone who touches a dead body is unclean for a week. And anyone who touches a person who touches a dead body is unclean for a day. So he's telling them, you as priests, if a family member dies, your favorite uncle you know, somebody dies, sorry, I can't go there. You know, I, I'm, I've got to stay here. It's commanded. Um, the only time that they could actually be a part of this process, you know, they didn't have it like us. They didn't do it where, you know, the priest would come in and preside over the body and do these things. <laughs> Instead, it was if your immediate relative isn't a priest, ain't nobody saying no words over him but you. You know, many people wouldn't even go to that. That's why they hired professional mourners, because they were willing to be unclean for money. I get it. You know, unless you were popular, unless you were rich, most people would avoid funerals or wakes or whatever you'd want to call it, unless there was something free, right? Then everybody shows up. Um, but they couldn't do anything that would prevent them from serving the people. Um, and then he goes on, you know, talking about, you know, he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Verse 5, they shall not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. 
which many of the priests of other religions would do as an honor or a sacrifice on behalf of the dead person. We've talked about that before, too. Um, Many people would get tattoos and body scarrings for that, too. Verse 6, they shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of the Lord their God, for they for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. So the idea of this, he's saying, is, you know, you've got to come before me. You need to be clean. You need to, you are, you know, you're not there. You're there to come before me. You don't need to ingratiate yourself with the people. You need to ingratiate yourself with me, he's telling them. You are there on behalf of the people to stand between their sin, to bring the atonement, to bring these things. And as we get into the high priest, you even begin to see that they are a type of Christ. Okay. Verse 7. Um, oh, no. Sorry. Verse 6. They shall be holy to their God, not profane the name of the Lord, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. Verse 7. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman. Nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I am the Lord who sanctifies you. For I, the Lord who sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. Um, And, you know, we talked about that again, that burn with fire. You know, does it mean that she is killed and put to death and then burned like trash? Possibly. Okay, notice too, that is the daughter of a priest, a Levite. Why? Because he is separated out from among the people. Um, Like we said too, there are some Hebrew commentators even that say this was branding. This was she was branded in exile. Kicked out. Done. Now, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, especially as husbands, and if you're ever going to, if you want to lead in the church, especially in Titus chapter one, verse six says a man is to be blameless. The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. So even in the church, we're supposed to have children that have been taught how to respect. And if they refuse and are in sin, gone. I've seen it happen in families. I've seen it where um, the parents were derided by many because the children would refuse and would live in sin and were even told, all you got to do is repent and stop doing that and you can come home. But they wanted to be accepted no matter what they did, no matter who they are. You know, to live in their sin and it was not accepted. And that's the thing that you and I might find hard sometimes because as believers in Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be dead to sin, which means we don't live with it. It's got to be done. Verse 10. He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. And we know the high priest tore his clothes during a certain person's trial, right? Broke the law to break the law. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. And it's like, I've done this for you. This is done. This is it. You're mine now. When that happens, when you step up to receive that anointing, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you can't be unborn. If you're born again, you can't be unborn. And he says, when that anointing oil comes on you as a high priest, that's it. There's no do-overs. There's no take-backs. Can I get a mulligan on that? It's not happening, right? And it's the same thing when you are born again as a believer in Jesus Christ. You can mess up. You can goof up. You can, you know, and, and you can get kicked out of the church. But you're born again. You can't get unborn. And you can go live in sin and be horrible and be miserable and think it's fun, but it's horrid and it's trashy and it's garbage. And then, you know, you realize, I don't have to live like this, man. I don't have to eat what the pigs are eating. I can go be a servant of my father and enjoy my life. You have been anointed. 
Okay, no, this is where the priest is a, a type of Christ. Peter told us when he was preaching to the people in Acts, and he said he was anointed to take the gospel to them, the good news that they've been saved. And just as he's a type of them, he's also a type of us because Peter calls us priests, holy nation. Do we act like this? He says, verse 13, he shall take a wife in her virginity because your line is to be pure. A widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot, these he shall not marry. But he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife, nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. He is doing something here. He has a purpose here. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron. And then so now he switches gears from the high priest back to the Levites, the tribe. And he says, no man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long. A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback or dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Now, a lot of people read that and they begin to think, well, you know, what is God doing this? Notice he doesn't say they aren't part of the family nor part of the tribe. He simply says they cannot do this particular task. There's a reason for that. Because they were required to perform certain things that had to be done correctly, had to be done according to the law. So you couldn't have someone that was blind, you know, you couldn't have someone that was blind making a sacrifice because he's taking the blood and he's throwing it just every which way, right? He's not throwing it on the altar where it is to go. He's not doing what he's called to do. Plus, the priests were a type of Christ. And had to point to the one who was perfect. Not that they were perfect, but pointing to the one that was perfect. Because we know all throughout the centuries, God has used many people who have what we would call defects, right? And he has used them mightily to serve him. Why? Because I think it's that same thing with that that great sheet coming down and, and God saying to Peter, rise, kill and eat. Because he had made us all equal. There's nobody better than anybody else. Period. And here it's for a specific purpose and reason. It is not because they are not worthy of it. Because he goes on in verse 22. He says he may eat the bread of God. Both the most holy and the holy. He says they they are, are part of you. He says they are still a part of you. They can still partake of these things. They are not to be shunned or separated. They are to be your family. Okay? Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect. Lest he profane my sanctuaries, I, the Lord, sanctify them. Okay? And remember, what happened when people didn't do what he told them to do? (laughs) Right? Flamethrower. Okay? So when he does this, it is not just for that purpose, but it is to protect the people who are suffering from these things. Because if they do it wrong, they're dead. Get that, right? I just want you to understand this. This is God, again, protecting this, protecting these people. God loves those that suffer in this fallen world. You can read Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, and it just talks to you about what God is doing here and the people that he's reaching out to. Chapter 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons. So, you know, now he goes back to the generalization of this and he says, speak to Aaron and his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. You know more than anybody to do it right. Say to them, whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. 
Whoever is a servant of the Lord are there by birth. They are servants. It is not a choice thing. You know, it wasn't when you hit 13, hey, do you want to be a Levite? It was, you're born into this. Now, for us, it's even different. We are born again into the kingdom of God because you asked him to save you, didn't you? He said, save me. And he said, all right then. And he gave you a whole new heart, a brand new being. You don't undo that. You don't, you know, you don't go back from that. This is the idea that we are born again. We are sons made free. We were chosen because we were chosen in him when we received the sacrifice that he made for us. And that's not something that I have to fight for or strive for or do. These guys were Levites because they were born into it. And you and I are sons of God because we were born into it when we were born again. Whatever man, he says, of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or has a discharge, they shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who is an emission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he could become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean till evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. And you can understand kind of why when a priest is walking, when Jesus is telling the story, you know, of the Good Samaritan, and he says the priest goes by, and there's a guy who looks dead on the road, and he's like, oh, no, you know, and he moves on, right? You can kind of understand a little bit his hesitancy for wanting to help a person. What happens if he dies while I'm, while I'm touching him, right? If he dies while I'm touching him, man, I can't do it for a week. Oh, I just better be careful. That's the mentality of the law. This guy might die, and if I'm touching him when he dies, then I'll be breaking the law, so, man, I'm sorry, I can't help you. We do that a lot, too, as believers in Jesus Christ sometimes. You know? Well, I don't feel this person is right or that person is right, and because they're not right, I'm not going to help them. God didn't tell you to judge whether they're right or wrong. He said, love them. I'm just supposed to love people. Let him sort the rest of it out. Now, if they claim to be believers in Jesus Christ, that's when we have conversations, right? I sense some of them coming where I work pretty soon because people keep making comments so you know just to let you guys know they did give me a different schedule um so we're going to try it out for a little bit but if it continues to impede my um service here um then i'm going to step out completely um i just don't think that there'll be a schedule that they could give me that would suffice but we're going to try it for a little bit please pray for me okay it is better than the one that i have but still anyway all right um, <clears throat> okay, where were we at? Verse 6. Um, unclean till evening. Verse 7. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. Afterwards, he may eat the holy offerings because it is his food. That's the only food you got coming. Um, verse 8. Whatever dies naturally or is torn by beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself with it, for I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my, my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby if they profane it. I, the Lord, sanctify them again and again and again. He reminds us, it's not about what you want. It's not about your choices. It's not about any of those things. It's, I am your God. Listen to me. Stop with your wanting and your, and your touchies and your feelies and just do what I tell you to do. No outsider shall eat the holy offering. So the Levites couldn't have guests over, you know, who were travelers and bring them in to eat because they had holy offerings there. But they also couldn't bring other Israelites in because they are an outsider. He shall eat the holy offering. One who dwells with the priest or a hired servant shall not eat the holy thing. So if you were an Israelite and you worked for him, you couldn't eat dinner with him no matter how much he liked you. And that's the same thing that we run into as believers a lot. There are things we want to do with people, things we want to hang out, things we want to do. But to, re to remain separate, not better than, but separate, different, sanctified. We're set apart for his work. And sometimes we've got to say, man, I would really love to, but I can't. 
And we need to give a reason. We need to let them understand what's going on in our lives. And we do those things. When I tell my friend, you know, and I have literally had a friend who tried to get me to go to a club, uh, sometimes called Gentleman's Club, which is not in remotely descriptive of the actual club, right? I've actually had a friend who knew I was a pastor and tried to get me to go with one with him because he thought, You've got, you're under grace. It's not a big deal. I know other pastors that go. That's a person that has not set themselves apart to be used by God. You've got to make your choices. I don't go by what people think or say or their philosophy. I go by this. If the priest, verse 11, buys a person with his money, he may eat it. So if the priest has a slave, as he's saying here, the slave has no choice. The slave can't go home and eat like the hired servant can. So he can eat. The one who is born in his house may eat the food. And if the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat of the holy offerings. That's even married to another Jew outside of the Levite tribe, many people believe. Either way, you know, it's again that reminder of you are separated for a different thing here. And even the things you eat at home, the things you take part in at home matter. Okay? But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child and has returned to her father's house as in her youth, so she's back under the covering of the home, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. You know? Oh, man, that was really good lamb. I saw it just laying there. Oh, no. Right? Right? That's a costly mistake because then you'd have to go get a lamb, add a fifth to it, and take that and go make that sacrifice. That's costly. Okay? You know, that's like saying, that's like, you know, that's like one of them $50 meals, right? That's like going to cork and pig. You know what I'm saying? But for a bite, literally for a bite. Okay? Um, Okay, um, that's unintentionally. Verse 15. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house... You know, so first you think the Levites got it good, right? They don't have to work. They don't have to do any of these things. And it's like, okay, maybe not so much, right? Speak to Aaron and his sons, to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or any of the strangers of Israel who offers his sacrifice or any of his vows for any of his free will offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, verse 19, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, verse 20, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. Only a perfect sacrifice is sufficient. And again, we have that point in the type of the priest, which is a type of Christ. You see. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a free will offering from the cattle of the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or an eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb that has any limb too long or too short, you may not you may you may offer as a free will offering, but for a vow it will not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord that what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering them in your land. Now in the book of Malachi in chapter one verse eight, here's what God says when people were doing this as on a regular basis. He says, When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? So he's saying, you are literally going against what I have said. Is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? A lot of times we as believers in Jesus Christ, if, you know, it's like if my pastor came in here tonight, I might act different. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's if my pastor from Houston came in, I might act different. I probably wouldn't. Actually, we'd probably get in an argument pretty soon. But anyway, moving on. Um, I'm messing with you. 
But I did tend to argue with him. But if it were somebody that you super respected, you know, for Marco, be Pastor Jerry, right? Um, for some of you, you may have a, a, either um, an authority or someone in your life that you, I mean, truly respect. And when they walk in the room, it changes the way you move, you behave, you stand. Okay? Some of you have those. Some of you may have just not respected anyone that greatly. Okay? For some of you that have been in the military, when a captain walked in, you behave different. You know, you snap too. You know, unless you were in the Navy, then you probably just drank a Coke and smoked a cigarette. Okay? But for most of you who have been in the military, you understand this. Right? And he says in Malachi, he's like, if you went to the president and everybody was bringing a gift to the president and everybody was bringing all these awesome gifts, you know, would you just bring like a pecan log from Bucky's? Right? You know? Would you say, hey, I went to Stripes and I got you a moon pie, Mr. President? You wouldn't do that. You know, you would give them the best. You, you know, you would want to give them the best because you respect them and you respect their office and who they are. And God is saying, you won't even give me what I deserve. But yet you'll do it in the world. Why is that? Verse 25, nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of those these as bread of your God, because their corruption is in them and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord, whether it is a cow or a ewe. Do not kill both her and her young on the same day. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free Will, this has got to be in your hearts. You do this. You are making an offering, he says. Verse 30, on the same day it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God I am the Lord. Now, when we've covered that in in a number of other chapters and the things that he's talking about there, and guys, you know, he repeats himself over and over and over and over and over again. And why does he need to do that? Because we don't get it. Because we don't get it. And as we look at this, again, I'm not laying down a law for you here. I'm not saying this is the, you know, this is what you got to do and this is what you got to do to be saved. Any of that. But I am calling for each and every one of us to examine our behavior. You know? Because, I mean, even the way I work. You know, I prayed about that today because I started getting attitude a little bit. I'm sitting there doing stuff and I'm like, you know, oh my gosh, I just want to tell this person, pay your bill, pay your bill. Right? And then I remember, it's like the Lord just tapping me on the shoulder. And he says, what are you supposed to do all things? And I said, as unto the Lord. I'm supposed to obey my boss as unto the Lord. I'm supposed to work with my coworkers and submit to them as unto the Lord. And I just said, all right then. Let me take my little self and put him aside. Got to remember he's dead and he needs to shut up over there. There are certain things I'm going to do, you know, because it's like a, there is a conviction. Okay. Which is one of the reasons I had, you know, even though I had put my two weeks in, when they changed my schedule, I stayed. Because I discussed it with my wife. And then we're going to pray about it tonight, too. She was on the road being with my grandbaby. Some of y'all saw him earlier. But many of the things we've covered in this chapter, we've covered before. You can look back at some of those recordings. I'm trying to get them all online. Um, I was hoping I would actually have some time off here this next week, but apparently not. Um... So we'll see what happens. I'll try and get everything caught up. But, you know, again, the law is a guide for us. The law reminds us that we do serve a holy God. And that you and I, you know, again, we cannot be sinless. But we can sin less. And we can seek to be obedient. And we can seek to love Him. And to remember that He said, even to us, in First Peter, be holy, for He is holy. 
not perfect. We can't be perfect. We just can't. But shouldn't we at least try? Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together, and we just lift up these things, um, Father, not as, not as a not as a whip, not as a rod to us. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here that um, is um, feels guilt, that um, you would remove it, Lord, or you would show them if, if there is correction that needs to be done in their life, that they would change it. Um, Father, I pray for myself that you would help me to to act like more of a man that eats meat and does not need to go back to milk, Lord. Um, I want to be faithful to you. I want to be... Um, walking in you i want to be right before you and and i want everyone here to experience that well as well lord not out of a sense of slavish devotion but as one of love because of the god that saved us the one that loves us so much and has set these things before us as examples and we have seen our brothers in christ in the early church who were willing to die for your name lord and help us to be willing to give up the things that cause us to to have a hurt heart or to have hurt feelings. Lord, let us put our feelings aside. Let us give even those to you. And help us, Lord, to walk in righteousness. To put aside our pride. To put aside all these things, our ego. The things that get in the way of us being able to love one another. And be examples of you. I just thank you so much for each and every person here, Lord. That they would experience your grace. The perfect love of Jesus Christ who was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect high priest, the perfect everything for us. And in doing so, has covered us and made us perfect. No matter who we are, no matter what we look like, no matter what happened to us or will 